Morning, church. Morning. Happy Sabbath. It's good to see all your smiling faces. Some people I haven't seen. Welcome, visitors. Um, I want to say that I appreciated the offertory music. It was very nice. And uh, I don't see any special music today. What happened there? We failed you. We failed you, Ray. Somebody fall asleep there or what? I fell asleep. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, anyways. So, um, if you were here for Sabbath school, you probably already got the sermon. So, we'll do it again for just a little bit. Um, I was... Born in Watertown, New York. My dad was up there teaching demolitions. And um, I think that now that he's in that nursing home up there in deep, the VA, he thinks he's still doing something like that, I guess. But it's, it's pretty rough. Um, he gets mad at me because it won't help him. But he's talking about people that aren't there and wants me to do this and that and the other thing and I, you know, what do you do? Tell a guy he's not, there's nobody there. You know, you just gotta play along with it and even if I play along with it, I'm not in the right spot or I'm not picking it up right or moving it or fixing it. What are you doing? So, it's really hard. And he, he has um, asked me to take his life twice now which is very difficult. And I understand that, you know, he'd probably rather be asleep. But, um, I don't know, what do you do? This life and sin and where it brings us is death. That's what happens. I mean, it's where we're all headed. Unless Jesus comes before that, right? We're going to be going to sleep. And I personally believe that more so now than ever before that we're going to see Jesus soon in our lifetime. Because this thing is rapidly rolling faster and faster. More and more. Either that or, or God himself is going to slow it down. But if he doesn't act, it's going to be soon. It really is. The world has literally lost its mind. I mean, truth is a lie and the lie is the truth. Everything is upside down. And yeah, I don't even want to get into politics, but I mean, things are crazy. I mean, they're absolutely crazy. So, um, beings that I was born in Watertown, New York, so that makes me a Yankee. Okay? Um, people say, darn Yankee. I tell them I got here as fast as I could. Okay? <laughs> I can't help the fact that my mother didn't, uh, she was supposed to stay. At Fort Bragg, which now they have changed the name because it's not politically correct, and I'm not going there either, but now it's something else, Fort Liberty or something. But that's where my mother was supposed to be, but she didn't listen very well, as I don't listen very well either. Maybe I get it from my mother, I don't know. But she went up there, and that's why I was born in Watertown, New York. So anyways, after Vietnam, Dad and Mom settled in uh, Liverpool, New York. And Liverpool is a salt town. And our little scripture here today talks about salt. And um, if you've been to the fellowship meal and I brought salt potatoes, you've tasted them. And they're pretty darn good. They get a lot of salt and people, are, they get really freaked out about salt. But salt is a good thing. And um, I was pulling wire the other day, and uh, heavy wire. 
and I was cramping up. I mean, my fingers would be just like my legs, and I, I said to my wife, what in the world? So she just takes this big old spoonful of Celtic salt, opens my mouth, throws it in there, and she says, here, drink some water. <laughs> and about 35 seconds or so, I was like, back to normal. That's really weird. Salt is a good thing. Without it, you could get in some trouble. I didn't realize that uh, I needed that salt that way, but I did. And Jesus is saying something here about salt, so let's get into it. Ye are the salt of the earth. That must be a good thing, huh? Sound like a good thing to you? Yes. Okay. But if the salt has lost its savor, what is, how does the salt lose its savor? And can it be restored? Is anything too hard for God? No. God talks about in Revelation, right? Repent, or I will take your candlestick, right? Right? Wherewith shall it be salted? Is it thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trotted under foot of men? So how do we continue to keep our saltiness? How do we... Where do we draw the line? I guess that's the real question here because I think that's what we called this little talk, right? I got it written down here somewhere. Walking the fine line. Walking the fine line. Rectitude, you could say. Right? Jesus always knew how to walk that line. Right? Because the line, brothers and sisters, between truth and error is very thin. <clears throat> very, very thin. And, um,. Thank God that He knows the way, he and, the way. and can teach. He is exactly he is the way, but He shows us the way because we don't know, really. I mean, do you do you know where to draw the line? Because I don't. I mean, there's a lot of things that I think are gray areas, and I don't have the answer for that. But the Holy Spirit does. Yeah. And Jesus, if we're plugged in, we can know. I mean, you, you can say all the right things and do it in the wrong tone of voice. Yeah. Right? I mean, people are really tender. And some people are really arrogant. <laughs> and i got to deal with both. And I have a hard time with people. I do. Some people I just want to bang their heads together because they're just difficult. And other people, you got to pick them up and carry them. You know? But I guess what we're supposed to do, brothers and sisters, is treat people as we want to be treated, right? Isn't that pretty much the golden rule. Huh? So what if you got this guy that steals your wallet? And God asks you to make a room for him in your house. What do you do? How do you handle that? You let it happen? Right? I mean, if God is asking you, pretty much got to, right? But do you... Leave your wallet on the kitchen table. He's living in your house. This guy that once stole your wallet. There's a little trust factor there, right? But how does God treat us? Because we've stolen. And we've lied. And we've coveted. Leave the wallet out. 
Yeah, he does. You know, we all have a lot of lessons to learn, and when we think that we know something, we can't learn anything. Really. It's really that simple. Because we just get so full of ourselves. I, I deal with a lot of egos. Guys that think they know a lot more than they really do. And I'm not taken away from the fact that they do know a lot. And they do good things. But um, humility isn't something that comes easy by men. Women, it doesn't seem to be quite as difficult for, but um, there's still pride in women. And I certainly, and you've heard me say it before, that I'm pretty much, <laughs> I got that. I'm pretty much convinced um, if we did get rid of pride, extinguished it from the earth, sin would be gone. Right? I mean, in that's where I'm going to stand until somebody proves me different. Greed. You wouldn't have greed if you didn't have pride. <clears throat> Why? <coughs> There'd be no need for it. Pride, I, I, and when you look at it, you go right back into heaven where all this big war started, right? What was the issue? Pride. Okay. If you are a big high up muckety muck, let's say, and there's a group of yous, and they're all going to have this, we're, gonna, we're all getting together to have this, all of us are all these high up muckety mucks, right? This yeah. big huge corporation that we run, we'll call it the Seventh-day Adventist Church for just, Bravo. for sake of, Bravo. but there's five or six of them that's going to go off in this little room and have a little super meeting, board meeting, right? So what happens out here? Oh, I'm not, why am I not in there? Right? Shouldn't I be part of that meeting? A little pride kicks up, right? What happened in heaven? I mean, you've God who has every right to do anything He chooses to do. Correct? And one of His creation that He has given everything to. I mean, what more could He have given to Lucifer than, Lu than He gave Him? There's nothing. So, all of a sudden, for however this happened, this pride came up. And I'm convinced, you know, you know people say, well, well, then why did God make him? Because if he's really God, he had to know that this was going to happen. Right? Hello? But do you ever ask yourself this question? Well... If it didn't happen here, it would have happened somewhere else. Or at some point, somehow, some way. I can't explain it. You can't explain it. Nobody can. Even the rest of the worlds that are watching this whole sin experiment, if you will. Okay. But God is just and holy and true. And I'm not going to try to second guess what he has done. What was done is done. But what I'm going to hold on to and be thankful for is the fact that God has said that this ugly thing, this sin experiment, problem, whatever, when he is done with it, it will never again raise its ugly head. So we have to go through to the bitter end to finalize this thing, to be done with it forever. Listen, the only place that there's sympathy for the devil, as the Rolling Stones might have said in a song years ago, is on this planet, right? Because the rest of the planets, the rest of the world, the rest of God's creation have no sympathy. None. Absolutely none. When Christ died on the cross, He rightfully owns this planet back, but her nice little story that she told right here, 
I don't know if I agree with the whole dollar though, because the, <laughs> the dollar falls a little flat, but that was good for your story. But it's a bigger illustration. We're talking infinite value. I mean, how do you put a number on God himself giving his life? I mean, when, when you stop and think about it, just stop for a moment and realize that when, when this is all done and God, so to speak, put the game back in the box, sin will never raise its ugly head again. All of you are made wonderful and beautiful, right? Who's going to carry scars for the rest of eternity? Only God will carry imperfection in Himself. He who is perfect and knows all things. Think about that for a moment. I, I, I don't know any greater love I, I, I mean, would you die for an ant? I mean, give me a break. Well, how do you, how do you value? Well, where is God? How big is God? How wonderful? How powerful? How much more is He than any of us? But yet, He considers man. It's mind blowing. What more could He have given to us? We, I, I talk about Lucifer. Right? What more can God have given than He has in Jesus Christ? What more? We're not talking about just the death on the cross. I mean, He took every sin, past, present, and future. I can't even imagine the anguish of that. I can't handle my own problems. Okay? I can't handle my own problems. And I'll tell you what, sometimes when I look in the mirror and I'm shaving, I'm scared to death of the guy in, that I see. Them eyeballs that I'm looking at terrify me. You know, I'm not, I'm not so concerned with the devil. I'm worried about this guy. He's got a problem. I'm not blaming somebody else. This guy's got a problem. And unless I give it all to Christ, I'm going to have real problems. I've met the enemy, brothers and sisters, and it's me. And I hope you realize the same. Because Jesus is, as Brother B said earlier today, the way, the truth, and the life. There is none other than Christ. And he is so patient, and I am not patient. He is so loving, and I can be loving, but I'm not always. And kind beyond words. But I'm not always kind, because you know what? When somebody does me wrong, I don't feel like being kind. When you slap me, I want to slap you back. That's what I want to do. But I want to get to a place, God willing, that I can, when I know that the guy that's betraying me, as Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, okay, which he knew was going to happen, this guy's coming at him, hail master, right, and betrays him with a kiss with a kiss. And what does Jesus say? Friend. Friend. You betray me with a kiss? Friend, he calls him. Could you do that? Could you call this person a friend? We are not capable of agape love in and of ourselves. We're not even very good at phileo. But with God, the Bible says all things are possible. We can learn to love as Jesus loves. 
we can learn to forgive as Jesus forgives. We, some of us need to learn how to forgive ourselves. We carry so much garbage, all of us, each and every one of us. You know, some people are just a lot better than others at hiding it. But we all have issues. And some of the people that I deal with, I mean, I, I run into a lot of transient people up there in Daytona. Man, when they walk by you, you can just hear the train cars behind them. <laughs> all the baggage that they have. It's hard. How would you like to be living outside? You know how hot it's been? I, we lost air conditioning the other day. And had to borrow an air conditioner from Ricky and Judy, and then I had one in the garage that have managed to keep it halfway decent in the house. But we live in this third world country because I have a 10-year warranty on my AC unit that's eight years old, but you can't get parts for it. Hello, what well, good's a warranty? You know, they said, well, maybe, you know, end of August, first of September, somewhere in there, we'd probably have you up and running. I said, yeah, thank you. Um, anyways, got a friend in the business and he came over and popped a new one in for us. And, I'll get the other one fixed eventually when the parts come in and then I'll have a spare if one of you guys run into that same trouble. I'll have one in the warehouse. You know? I mean, that's what it's all about. We're supposed to help each other. And I really appreciate Ricky and Judy's. That was a brand new area. They never even took it out of the box. So I got to make it all dirty for them and fire it up and make sure it works. Appreciate that. Absolutely. Appreciate you, brother. Anyways, let's move on to verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. That's who Jesus is talking about, his church, right here. The light of the world, as messed up as we are, okay? We are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Amen? Amen. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Glorify your Father which is in heaven. What are we doing to glorify our Father which is in heaven? Are we finishing this work? Are we doing what we're called to do as, a, as the Adventist church in a whole? Living testimony. Verse 17 says, Think not that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill but to fulfill. Let's turn our Bibles to John 4.34. You there? Amen. Jesus saith unto, unto them, My meat, what does my meat mean? Food. His food, his nourishment, right? Is to what? To do the will of him that sent me. And what is the next little part there? Woo! Huh. What's more important than that? Here is Jesus that we all claim is our way, our truth, and our life. He's, he's us. He's, the, he's it. Right? And what is he saying? We claim to be the people of the book, right? Jesus saith unto them, My meat, my food, is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish the work. He's not come to abolish, throw away the law, right? What are the Advent people supposed to be known for? People of the book, right? 
And what what about the book? I, I people ask, well what is a Seventh day Adventist? What is a Seventh day Adventist? Well I'm not asking you guys. What is a Seventh day Adventist? Fundamental Bible believer. Fundamental Bible believer. Okay, there's a lot of people that claim that. <laughs> Somebody who walks with God, okay. How about a real Jew? Who is Jesus? He's the real Jew, right? And I'd say, what is a Seventh day Adventist? A Seventh day Adventist is a Jew that is free because he knows that Jesus Christ is always will be the way, the truth, and the life. So we don't throw away the commandments, which is the covenant, correct? Is it not the covenant? It's, it's a marriage contract, right? Isn't it? Let, let's go there. Let's go to Exodus. Let's go to Exodus. Exodus 20, right? Yep. All right, I'm going to start in verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, and the heading I have over verse 20 says the Decalogue. And you tell me if this doesn't sound like wedding vows. Okay? You tell me. I am the Lord thy God, which has brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So he's done what? He saved this weak gal, right? Thou shalt have no other gods before me, right? No other men. <laughs> Correct? Hello? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images, image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. He wants nothing before him. Is that fair for God to have? Isn't that the way a marriage should be too? Between a man and a woman where nothing could come between them? Nothing. Right? Doesn't, doesn't Jesus say his church is the bride? Doesn't he talk about it? And Have you ever read the book of Solomon, Song of Solomon? I mean... Yeah, what makes it so significant is that God is so holy. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that he can dwell in something that's unholy, like us, that He wants to make us pure. He declares us pure. I mean, that's how He can be in us. But I'm telling you what, if somebody slaps me and I want to slap them back, am I pure? No. That's a bit prideful. Isn't it? Really? If I had no pride and I thought my brother was better than myself and he comes up and slaps me in the face, I would think, oh, maybe I did deserved it or maybe I did something that made him upset or you know what, right? I got to think that I'm stronger or better or somehow above him to want to be, isn't it pride? I mean, it just please correct me if I'm wrong. Verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the, of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. Hate me. How can someone hate God? Think about that. I mean, how does that even, how does something like that even make sense? How, God, the Bible says that God is love. 
doesn't say that you know this is this is part of him this is some attribute that God has the Bible clearly states that God is love so everything that he is and everything that he does derives from the fact that God is love it's not part of him it is who he is and that's why this thing has to wrap up 